Now, the situation is different in the Arab and Muslim worlds. Let's, let's hear oppression, suffering, uh, desperation. These really are causes for radicalization. Let's take, for instance, the Arab world. The Arab world reaches from Morocco to Indonesia. Um, it's, oh, excuse to the Persian Gulf. It's larger than the United States. There are 300 million Arabs, about the same number as there are Americans. Now, if you were to take oil out of the Arab economies, and only a few of the 22 Arab countries produce an appreciable amount of oil. Those 300 million Arabs produce less for export than the 5 million Finns. Essentially less than the Nokia telephone company, which is the main export of Finland. This is the little Nokia that I carried around when I was in Saudi Arabia and now whenever I travel, but you know, the Saudis wouldn't let me in as a reporter. Uh, after 9-11, for a year and five months, I kept making applications for visas and so on, and they kept stalling me, and I finally realized I was never going to get it as a reporter. So I took a job. I became an expat worker. I got a job uh, uh, mentoring young reporters at the Saudi Gazette in, in Jeddah, which is Osama bin Laden's hometown. Uh, it was the best piece of bad luck because instead of being a reporter in a hotel room making calls and so on, I had a I had a flat, I had a car, I had a job I had to go to every day, and I had all these wonderful young Saudi reporters teaching me far more about their country than I could ever have learned as a, as a reporter. But I often reflected while I was in Saudi Arabia that this one product outweighs the industrial output of the entire Arab world. Now, put oil back into those Arab economies, those 22 countries. The gross national product is still less than that of California. Now, let's, let's talk about the Muslim world. 1.3 billion people, the preponderance of whom live in the 57 countries that are members of the Organization of the Islamic Conference. The gross national product of those 57 countries altogether is less than that of Germany. So we're talking about one-fifth of the world's population, the Muslim world, but one-half of the world's poor. These are countries, these are economies that offer their young people very little to look forward to. Now I'm not saying that poverty by itself is a cause of radicalization. I think it's one contributor, and there are several others that I'm going to outline for you that are less easily quantified. One is the lack of civil society. Now, what is civil society? Well, this is civil society, citizens coming together, talking, you know, sharing thoughts. Um, that I think wonderful, magnificent election we're underway in the United States right now is a great example of a civil society uh, examining its problems and trying to resolve them in a peaceful manner. Well, let me tell you about the situation in Saudi Arabia. I'm not trying to lump all Arab and Muslim countries together. They're very different. But just to speak of the Saudi situation for a moment, what was life like for my young reporters at the Saudi Gazette? There were, there were no parks, very few museums, there was no theater, no plays, no movies, no nightclubs, no public music, the internet was monitored and controlled, there was no dating, women couldn't drive. Uh, that entire space of life that we call civil society simply didn't exist. There was nothing between the government and the mosque, except shopping. Uh, recently in Jeddah, a new IKEA furniture store opened, and it was such a thrilling event that 15,000 people showed up. Two were trampled to death. 
Now, it's not surprising that in such an impoverished civil society, the depression is a real problem. All of my reporters were depressed. Some of them bit their fingernails down to the nubs and their legs jiggled and couldn't sleep at night. Remember, one of my reporters did a story about a study of depression done at King Abdulaziz University, which is Bin Laden's alma mater. Of the, 60, of the 2,000 students surveyed, 67% of the boys and 72% of the girls showed symptoms of depression. 7% of the girls in this strict Muslim country admitted that they had attempted suicide. Another factor, also very difficult to quantify, but I think key to understanding this radicalization, especially in Saudi Arabia, is the gender apartheid. It's less pronounced elsewhere, although the delay in marriage is a problem all across the Muslim world. But just to speak of the situation in Saudi Arabia, this meeting would never take place. The women wouldn't be here. And it takes a toll. Uh, I'll tell you the story of Najla, one of my female reporters at, at the Saudi Gazette. Uh, the female reporters uh, were in a separate office under the stairwell, and nobody ever saw them. And I insisted I couldn't teach them if I couldn't see them. So I, I, I managed once a week to get the women to come up to the newsroom, and we'd have a we'd have a meeting. And nobody, you know, it was unprecedented. Uh, this little black train of women uh, coming up into the newsroom. And one of them, Najla, uh, had an appointment in Riyadh early in the morning before the first flight from Jeddah arrived. And so as a single Saudi woman, uh, in order to travel, she had to have the written permission of her, the man in charge of her, whoever that would be, her father, her husband, her brother, even her son, whoever is the man of the house. And so she got her father to sign a permission, written permission for her to travel by herself. As a single Saudi woman, she can't drive, so she had to fly. She flew into Riyadh. She can't stay in a hotel by herself. So she gets off the airplane and she goes and sits down. Now as it happens, the Riyadh airport closes at 11 at night and the guard came through and said, you, what are you doing? You can't stay here. And she said, what are you going to do with me? I remember that attitude. And what could he do with her? She couldn't stay in a hotel. Could he throw her out on the street? He finally decided to let her sleep on the carpet of the mosque in the, in the airport. And then he turned out all the lights and locked the door. And Nafla spent the night in the airport by herself. And the next morning, they turn on the lights, and she's able to go to her appointment. Now, that's what it's like for a woman. But it takes a toll on the men, too. I, I remember I went to a shopping mall with one of my reporters, and he sees two Saudi women descending the escalator. They're entirely encased in, in black, the black abaya, the black hijab, and even, not, not just the niqab they had their eyes covered as well. They were like like in a birdcage. And he turns to me and he says, check them out. <laughs> Just give you that story as one measure of the desperation <laughs> Saudi guys feel. They're unsocialized. They haven't spent their, their, their teenage years learning how to please girls, which is a lot of what civilization really is. <laughs> now, another factor, very difficult to quantify, but I think key to understanding the, the radical mind in, inside the Islamist world is humiliation. If you read Bin Laden, you'll see it's one of the most common words in his vocabulary. And many Muslim men have been humiliated, physically humiliated, like Zawahri, thrown into a, a prison after, after the Sadat assassination and torture, uh, put in a cage with wild dogs, huh? just unbelievable savage. 